Well, believe it or not, it is actually 530. Oh and my. Um, that means that I actually get to welcome everyone formally uh, to this exciting program, which is called Finding Funny in a Screwed Up World, a conversation with four amazing New Yorker cartoonists. And uh, this program is actually created in conjunction with our current exhibition which is Liza Donnelly Comic Relief, uh, which features the work of another wonderful New Yorker cartoonist. And we are very, very happy that you've joined, up, joined us. This is actually the first in a series of Tuesday evening programs at 5.30, so please stay tuned for other things. But in the meantime, we just have a really wonderful evening for you. And this conversation is really gonna look at the ways that um, or, or I should say the role of humor in challenging times. And we are lucky to have with us, and maybe they'll wave, Bob Eckstein, Ed Corin, Teresa Burns Parker, and <laughs> Michael great. Shaw, uh, who are all gonna share their experiences as visual commentators for the venerable, venerable publication and share some of their many memorable cartoons. And there are many, many, many memorable cartoons from each of them. They'll also consider the role of humor in challenging times and the ways that cartoons inspire us to keep smiling despite it all. Whether irreverent, ironic, or absurdly entertaining, cartoons do much more than make us laugh. With humor, clarity, and empathy, these witty, intelligent reflections on the human condition shape cultural narratives, and they invite us to engage with the things in life that we would rather sometimes not. Following the artist comments, um, we will look forward to your questions via Zoom or YouTube. So please do send them along in the chat so we can post the, pose them to the panel. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce the artists who will be with us tonight. Bob Eckstein is a New York Times bestseller, award-winning illustrator, and the world's leading snowman expert, as you will see. He's the author of the illustrated history of the snowman. Bob teaches at New York University and has two new books coming out, The Elements of Stress and All's Fair in Love and War by the World's Greatest Cartoonists, actually, which is available in our museum store. So we're excited <laughs> about that. Uh, we're grateful for the wonderful work that Bob has done to make this program possible. Uh, and um, all of our current participants are featured in his current book. Ed Corin has been a contributor to The New Yorker for close to six decades and his illustrations have appeared in a wide range of publications, including The New York Times, Newsweek, Time, GQ, Esquire, Sports Illustrated, Vogue, Fortune, Vanity Fair, and The Nation, as well as The New Yorker, of course. <clears throat> He's published several collections of his work and books for children as well. His 2018 book, In the Wild, is a collection of cartoons inspired by, as he says, country life, ex-urbanites, locals, and the ironies of living in the boonies. Ed lives in Vermont and has been a long-term member of his town's fire department. Teresa Burns Parkhurst is a cartoonist whose drawings appear in The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, Barron's, the Harvard Business Review, Reader's Digest, Playboy, and Airmail, among others. She designs greeting cards for Oatmeal Studios and Sellers Publishing, and uh, appears in Everyone's a Critic, the ultimate cartoon book. She is, as she says, both proud and ashamed to have been counted among the usual gang of idiots at Mad Magazine for 16 years. She lives in Albany, and says that she enjoys not going places. <laughs> we are honored to know that. that this is the first time that Teresa has spoken publicly about her amazing cartoons. So welcome. Thank you. And Michael Shaw's curious cartoons have appeared in The New Yorker since 1999. They've made appearances in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Harvard Business Review, Prospect, and online at weeklyhumorous.com. They've also been seen on Cocktail Napkins, Assorted Textbooks, ABC News, an episode of, episode of 60 Minutes, and MSNBC's now moribund Ronan Farrow, Farrow, Farrow Daily, where his blank cartoon was shared by thousands of people following the Charlie Hebdo attack. 
Michael's current day job is as storytelling specialist and wizard of light bulb moments at the University <laughs> of Wisconsin Green Bay, which means that he works as a writer in the university's marketing and communications I department. Figured that out. <laughs> I did. I figured it out. A little quick research. Um, <laughs> I also want to introduce my colleagues, Rich Bradway, who is uh, running this wonderful program from the technical perspective, and our chief educator, Mary Burley, who is behind the scenes uh, looking at all of your questions. So with that, I would love to invite Bob to jump in. We are going to actually look at some wonderful images. And um, Bob was uh, a great inspiration for this program. College, there we go, that's the first one. Um, and uh, we're, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna get this full screen, okay. Let's see, can everybody see that okay? Didn't come up yet. Sorry, I'm just gonna try to get this so I can see you too. You need to share your screen, Stephanie. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't do that yet, did I? Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And Stephanie, while you do He that, does sound like the powerful Oz. He does. From behind the curtain. Well, Bob, would you like to start, as I, as I share my screen, by yeah. tel telling us just a little bit about how you got, um, mm -hmm. got going with the book? Yeah, and let me just thank you for the, those great introductions and uh, I want to welcome everyone who's watching now. This is really exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone who's watching us. Um, we'll just we're going to see first the um, the book that actually was mentioned. Um, this book is um, the new one coming out. It's about dating, marriage, and divorce because cartoonists are such experts on relationships, <laughs> and all our relationships have been tested during this pandemic. Uh, I feel like this pandemic has been one big test for the whole world. But I put this book together by um, inviting a lot of my friends and all the people that, who I admire so much. And I got thousands of submissions and we, we, brought, we brought it down to 135 of the best. It's really a funny book. And everyone on the panel is really well represented in the book. And um, yeah, I, I guarantee you'll have a good time. So uh, we'll move on to the show. Stephanie, you can. Great. So um, I myself, I'm a cartoonist. I started my interest in cartooning when I entered the caption contest in the New Yorker. I was actually just entering on a fluke. It was the first contest and I came up as runner up. And then I didn't really think anything of it. But 10 years later, I was having lunch with cartoonist Sam Gross and he kind of dared me to become a cartoonist. And then I, um, you could, and then I decided to uh, try that. At the time, 10 years after I did the contest, I was at that time a snowman expert. I had traveled the world for seven years and done all this research on the subject of when, when man first made snowman. And I had hired all the cartoonists to be in the book, but I wanted an intermission in the book and to have a break, so I used all these snowman cartoons. Um, and I actually ran out of money. Look at advance and stuff. I ran out of money. So it says, uh, so where do you see yourself in five months? What happened was, is I had some space left over in the book, so I filled it in myself with a cartoon or two. And, and then I actually took Sam Gross up on his uh, dare. And I went to the New Yorker and went in with a batch of cartoons. And it was a total beginner's luck because I was able to show Bob Mankoff a, a batch of cartoons and he actually purchased the, one of the first cartoons I drew. Um, and I became a cartoonist I knew when I started being asked, uh, you can advance it. Uh, when I was asked, where do I get my ideas? And I think that's what, the question everyone always asks cartoonists is, where do you get your ideas? Um, this cartoon actually is gonna be running in the new Reader's Digest. It was a cartoon actually that I had flirting around for a while um, and I posted it on Facebook and it actually went viral. 
It had about 800,000 likes and shares a few years ago, and I'm sure it has over a million now. Um, it's very popular in Brazil and in Asia, and a lot of yoga centers have used this themselves illegally, and I actually settled out of court with one to, uh, because they made it their whole logo and everything. But this cartoon actually was part of a batch. And just to uh, answer one of the other questions that a cartoonist are always asked is, how do you submit your work? Well, we send in batches in person or we, we send them in electronically, usually in groups of like eight or 10, and they call them a batch. And then hopefully the art director or the cartoon editor um, at the New Yorker's title is cartoon editor, they hold some and then they will show it to the editor of the magazine. In that case is David Rudnick. Um, in this case, I do remember submitting this um, to Bob Mancroft. Um, he, he wouldn't hold it. I did resubmit it and um, he still, I still couldn't convince him to hold it. And it's finally getting published somewhere. So you just never know, but that answers another question of do people resubmit their cartoons? And they do, and this was a favorite of mine. So anywho, uh, the first question is, where do I get my ideas? Of, uh, my garage, actually the roof of it. Uh, this is where I go to work. Um, I commute by wooden ladder. And uh, you'll see that I sit up on this bench that I made. Um, it was an Adirondack bench, they call it. That's the design, just a few pieces of wood, cost me $15. And uh, this is in Pennsylvania, where I'm zooming right now. Um, I get a lot of peace and quiet up here because there's no internet. And where do I get my ideas? Well, I do try to set my mind into a state of playfulness, something that I learned from Monty Python, uh, John Cleese. And I do try to find myself allowing my brain to come up with different ideas, allowing myself to make mistakes if I have to, and just trying to find any ideas that might pop into my head. Advance. Um, this is my first pandemic. So um, all my work has been about the pandemic. I've done about 10 covers, all with a pandemic theme. I've written about a dozen stories in different magazines, all about the pandemic. Um, as you could see in the, the next cartoon, that um, my own plagiarism is a pandemic. I'm even stealing my own ideas. Um, I've done about 50 pandemic cartoons. And um, this news cycle really just writes itself. Um, the, the piece I did here was based on the Goya bean uh, scandal. Or, or controversy, and I came up with titles, and I'll read some of them now. Um, one says, hashtags, whole stewed lemons, lemmies, I'm sorry, mole sauce, we have canned applause, white rice matters, we have a Goya can that says lock her up, we got paper towels, self-absorbed. I won't read the last one for the delicate constitutions in the audience. So uh, we'll move on to another piece I did, and that was um, Pandemic Monopoly. And um, I did the tokens as well. We have, um, we have a Confederate statue as a new token. I replaced the popular shoe with a kneeling football player. And here we have some different spaces. I'll read a couple in case you can't see it. Um, the community on rest card says complete first Iron Man remotely from living room. The one above it is invited to Zoom wedding, pay $100 for a gift. And then the other card says, went to Disney World, go get tested. And here's some other spots on the board with one of the other new tokens, which is a roll of toilet paper. Could advance it. Thanks. And that's the, uh, the little dog, the favorite dog with the mask. So one of the other things I did during this pandemic was to write a book with Michael on this panel about stress and how to cope uh, with this year. It was meant to help people with this whole year. Uh, neither one of us are trained doctors, but it feels like everyone has pivoted and is doing something different anyway. So I figured, why not us as well? 
I notice that when I do book events, that happens all the time now when people ask, uh, they ask me, so how do you write a book? And often it's someone like a heart surgeon and I will say sometimes, well, how do you do heart surgery? Because I get a little insulted when people feel like they could just write a book like that. But this is now the new thing and, and me and Michael are giving our, our try with it with elements of stress. So here's another cartoon I did on the pandemic. Um, I think that lifeguard's going out there just to not save someone, but to separate those two women on the left. And then the last cartoon, and I do hope the year ends a little bit better than this one shows it's gonna end. Um, I'm now gonna pass the baton on to Ed, whose work I really adore. And I wanna thank him for being a part of the panel and being part of the new book coming up. And thank you. Bob, thank you so much. Um, your drawings are just amazing and wonderful. Uh, okay. Welcome, Ed. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. We are thrilled to have you. Let's see if we can get started here. Should we start with this one? Ed, how did you get started as a cartoonist? Do you want to do you want to take us take us back there? Well, I have to to um, just to counter poise my experience with that of Bob because it took me close to seven years <clears throat> from the time I started uh, contributing ideas to the New Yorker to the, the to be considered by William Shawn, the then editor back in 1958. Um, my first cartoon was accepted in 1962 and my second one was in 1964. So there <laughs> I can't say that it was a, a huge bounding success right off. And my hats are off. my hat is off to you, Bob. I, I'm I'm really impressed um, by the rapidity with which you become a cartoonist for the magazine. Ah, that um, is my other it's my that's my day job <laughs> or not my day job. I'm a volunteer in our local fire department. I've done it for 30 some odd years, hard to give up. I love it. I'm, it's a way of being a communitarian, of giving back to um, the society, community I live in. And also because of the solitude that most of us uh, live with uh, in our daily working lives, it's a kind of social, social life for me that is very unpredictable. It, uh, I may at this very webinar be called out to an accident or a fire or some, some need from some citizen. This was taken on the interstate, which we serve, Interstate 89 that goes through Vermont. Um, we have a section of it to which we respond for all manner of disasters and uh, human tragedies, in fact. So, um, and sometimes very dumb things that do not require much of anything. So it's in truth, the life of a fire firefighter anywhere, but we do it as, as um, amateurs in a way, although we're pretty good at it. And it's, uh, there are more volunteer firefighters in the U US than there are paid professional ones. Anyway, um, cartooning, back to that, my... Um, do you want to read this caption? Oh, sure. Um, he, is, he is saying to this gentleman who is somewhat older uh, than she, she said, you're really nice, Richard. I was hoping I could fix you up with my mom. So, <laughs> so it, it is, um, you know, what I do is, is more comment on the human condition than political or uh, kind of contemporary events. I mean, I have not done really anything on the pandemic per se, although a lot of it refers back to it in many ways. And um, so the way I got started uh, as a cartoonist was more as, as an artist and when I was young, but then when I was in high school and I started drawing for the high school publications, which then were uh, in great quantity and then college, 
uh, of the College Humor Magazine, of which I became the editor as well, and on and on. So I had a long uh, kind of apprenticeship <laughs> in this divorce sale. Um, this is, of course, gender defined, and all of the, the so so called supposed objects of of domesticity, her side, and all the the guy stuff, the man. The, uh, the the macho stuff, the guns, the boat, the, the golf clubs, all the, the, the which is of course why they're getting divorced. I mean, these are it's a it's a drama, and my attitude towards cartooning is that of a theater director. And so what I do is I orchestrate the scene, I cast the drawing, and then I I set the lighting, I discover the right moment and the relationships between the characters. So here is a good example of that. Your father and I want to explain why we've decided to live apart. <clears throat> so how did that come about? Um, it was someone saying something to that <clears throat> effect. Uh, my, my attention really was focused on that phrase, this living apart, decided to live apart and what, drama and what consequences and what led up to it and what what led up to this particular moment with all their children uh, and the each each one of these children mice children are drawn specifically each one's different because each one's reaction is somewhat different from the other and the two parents ex-parents to be or ex spouses each have their own relationship to this news that they're giving and the, the, it's the body language it's the expression it's this the gaze all of that not to mention the huge <laughs> things put in. so that's it's amazing that you were able to draw this cast of thousands it's it's just incredible whether i've never counted them because <laughs> i'm glad you did <laughs> Uh, good, this is something we, we have not been doing lately. Good morning, folks. This is Captain Holwood from the flight deck. We'll be cruising at 35,000 feet today, and I'll be finally taking control of my life, struggling to satisfy the needs of only one person, me. Uh, that is a truly encouraging uh, announcement <laughs> of the flight deck for all those passengers and their reactions are all varied as you can see. I mean, you can't have just, I didn't want to draw the same reaction uh, or the same character or the same anything. And, he, and the flight attendants are equally perplexed. So it puts the whole flight into question as indeed a kind of putting your life into question so in this man's somewhat flaky guy's hands so there's uh and do you do you tend to draw and redraw uh many times or do you generally get it pretty quickly no the, each of these <clears throat> is pulling teeth one uh they take a long time and they uh, they're first done in pencil uh i do them pencil i sketch it out roughly then a little bit more detail and finally when i I start inking and then it changes as well. It's, it's all a, a kind of process that, that uh, is unpredictable and um, variable. It just is just never the same. So um, this is an earlier drawing. I mean, my drawings have evolved over time uh, from very simple and there are a few earlier ones in this PowerPoint. Um, and they, it is, People say, well, <clears throat> have, you, have you worked to change it? And, 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 and no, I mean, most artists don't, I know some who do, but uh, by and large people uh, who practice this profession, this visual of visual notation, uh, there's a gradual evolution in thinking of style, of, of uh, just interest in subject and so on. It's not, it, I've changed hugely over these 60 years. Is there an ex-wife somewhere in there? <laughs> the dating scene, which of course the pandemic has put on hold. This is my favorite uh, 
bar in Montpelier, Vermont, a three penny <laughs> tap, and it's very close to, um, to what it's like. Um, pared down, of course, but I love to have detailed environments. I mean, again, the, the uh, analogy of, of, a, of a theater, piece of theater um, that is frozen in place. I love the details because you can go into this. You should, my, my no, uh, idea is that these are drawings that can be delved into and, you know, you can dive into them and just pick things out that then illuminate the caption, which is a kind of a, 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 a piece, a frozen moment when two people are interacting uh, and, and everything around them is exactly, you know, somewhat uh, illuminates what's going on in between them. Like a spotlight, it's wonderful. Yeah, now this is a very early drawing, but it's very of the moment. It says tonight, we're gonna let the statistics speak for themselves. <laughs> and it does refer, of course, to our uh, statistically sensitive government and so on, and, uh, and the tug of war and, or battle, cultural battle over statistics. and. Uh, and science, so it's um, <clears throat> a, it, it all comes back to, to, to the. It's what Lily Tomlin once said: "No matter how cynical I get, I can never keep up." So, <laughs> <laughs> and this is this informs my working life. So, okay, this is uh, also from some time back. But it's, if you were to boil your book down to a few words, what would be its message? I mean, this is the days of, of TV shows with book interviews, and I suspect they're very few in number these days, but they're all, you know, transferred to, to the internet in one form or another. But as you can tell by the old style TV camera, the, the vintage this, drawing, this cartoon refers to. That's wonderful. And actually, if any of our artists want to jump in and comment on anyone else's work, we'd love to have your thoughts. Well, I love this cartoon so much. It was in the first book in the series, as well as the cartoon coming up. I want to know if, Ed, are you a nib man? Do you use a nib? Am I a nib man, Michael? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yeah, I, I have a dip in, I dip in ink, India ink in a bottle, uh, you know, with, with um, a nib, a speedball A5, uh -huh. a little nib. It is just perfect for my, this, my uh, needs. This might be personal, but I've always had nib issues. Nib issues. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm left-handed, and I just—it's gro grotesque. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, that I'll I can. Put a pool of ink. Oh, my my sympathies. <laughs> Ed, you mentioned that you actually drew this before self-publishing yeah. was popular. Yeah, it was. A, I can't remember the exact date, but it was in the '90s, '80s, and it was when. You know, publishing was was viable and healthy. You know, big trade trade book publishing, um, and when the advent of self publishing, which is I guess within the last ten, maybe fifteen years, started to emerge. So that yeah, so it has a new life. This this it was. Uh, I mean, this was a, I don't know if you can see, but it's a book signing, and uh, there's a, the author in his bow tie is the celebrity of the moment. And this man or book with his glass of wine is clearly an attendee at the book signing, uh, somewhat somewhat off on the, on the it's side. A great cartoon, great yeah. cartoon. Well, thank I'm you. I'm sure it brings a lot of angst to a lot of self-published writers out there. <laughs> well, this is, yeah, I mean, this is, this is chronicles the, the huge transformation of publishing and reading and intellectuality and on and on and on. So there we are. Yeah. Ed, I got a comment on something you said earlier when you said our careers were, were opposite. You're right. After my first sale, it's been downhill since. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope it's only, only a, a, a short downhill. Um, I'm only doing this to support my writing. So it's, it's a complex drawing, but it's, uh, you know, he's, he's clearly not robbing the bank, but he's, a, he's, he's a, an accomplice. And, um, <laughs> and it's kind of refers to all the gigs people do for their 
day jobs or their gig jobs to just keep moving as a, as as creative people, you know. And writing is only is a, a kind of uh, stand-in for all of what we do, and a lot of people who are now part of the gig economy. Ed, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful to see your drawings. Uh, pleasure to welcome Teresa Burns Parkhurst. Uh -huh. um, well, let me start by saying this feels like, um, I feel like a local band coming on after the Rolling Stones, after hearing them speak so <laughs> eloquently. Um, I am not a public speaker, and I found out that you can actually be all alone in your house and still have social anxiety. So please bear with me. Um, so Teresa, this, how did you get started? Uh, in greeting cards. I mean, I always used to make my own cards for everybody. And sadly, since I started doing this professionally, they don't get homemade cards anymore. Um, greeting cards. And then I was introduced to John Caldwell, who became, who was another cartoonist. He worked for National Lampoon and Mad and The New Yorker and many other publications. And he um, became my mentor and my dear friend. He lived not far from me. Um, and he, I didn't really know what gag cartooning was. So he told me what it was and gave me a bunch of addresses and I just did what he said to do. And then it worked. <laughs> um, these two images are, I actually came up with some COVID related birthday cards, which I felt a little bit bad about at first. Um, but I pitched them to both the companies I work for. And I said, you know, you can skip the advance or whatever. Like, let's just see if, if people want them. And, and sellers, RSVP, took two of them. So I've yet to see if they're going off the shelves or not. Um, but that's what, what these are. And of course, this is you're six feet apart and we're all gonna look, at least at a certain age, you look a little better from um, six feet apart. So the, the, the inside greeting just ties into that, you know, and, and to your health. Um, let's see, here is one that I drew, uh, Airmail published that. And the caption says, it's the, this mother or mother-in-law saying to uh, her grown child, with children. Gosh, before you know it, they'll be all grown up and making poor decisions that you can't comment on or ever make peace with. <laughs> and um, I don't have kids of my own, but I, uh, I know people who do. So that's where that inspiration came from. Great. Trying to keep our mouths shut. Um, we can go to the next. That. Oh, and this, well, thank you very much. Barron's published this. I, I, pitched this to a bunch of different places and Barron's finally picked it up. It's a couple having drinks and the man is saying, I have a confession to make. There's another woman I haven't been listening to. <laughs> so speaks for itself, right? Um, Teresa, is it, is it common that you have to um, share things with different publications to get something published? I would say fairly common. I've definitely shopped. One of the um, cartoons that the New Yorker bought um, is like now it's on a greeting card and it's fairly well recognized. And I, I shopped that like to the Harvard Business Review and Barron's and I'm sure the New Yorker one time around. So yeah, you know, but you never, there's no set, set way. Here's another Barron's cartoon. Um, this is some um, pioneers. I'd love to draw more horses if people would hire me to do it, but um, <laughs> he's saying to his little family, we'll settle and work this land so that our descendants might live abundantly and hyper-focus on their appearance, which is kind of what happened. A great over the horse. Years. Well, I used to draw a lot of horses. He's kind of fat now that I look at him. But let's, um, talk, let's talk later. Maybe we'll do a horse book. <laughs> The horse Don't too. tease me. Don't say that. Dangling okay. that carrot. Uh, Bob, come on. Bob. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm leaving the room. Oh, this, uh, yeah. I, I actually managed to sell a couple of pandemic related um, daily cartoons to the New Yorker. And this was one. Um, and it's classic, uh, you know, person in their house making a little 
clean space for their their Zoom meeting while chaos reigns. Um, and some of the comments, uh, when you see it, when it's posted on social media, a few people said, well, what were the what were the chicken heads? <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> And in my head, they were like Nerf things that kids shoot. That's oh. what they were. Oh. Like yeah. sticky, those those suction things that you can shoot. Teresa, I'm getting so, ahead of George Booth with this cartoon. I have to tell you that. Well, I do. I like detail, um, not in the way that Mr. Corrin does, but I like um, I like thinking about ordinary things in people's houses and um, I did a recent, a recent one for the New Yorker and I had so much fun making, um, this guy's dresser. I put, um, just for men, nobody could see it. Like, I only know what it is. <laughs> uh, just for men. I had, a, um, I do <laughs> some relics like that little food that nobody buys anymore. So anyway, that was a pandemic. Teresa, you um, mentioned during our practice that uh, your backdrop today kind of relates to the Yes, pandemic. thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. This is a tribute to um, my clothing, which has been mostly ignored since um, March 14th. And it sits in there and wonders why, you know, why can't we go out anymore? Why aren't we doing anything? And so today I thought it's colorful and it hides things and um and i just wanted to you know give a few props to my my clothes oh, well, thank sale? you stephanie <laughs> i wanted to i wanted to say too um can you hear me yes i can oh, okay um that that drawing just before this was also in the tradition of george price and uh with his focus on chaos and, and his interiors <laughs> that are just so rich and com complex and, and really came back to the main idea of what he was was after. Uh, well, so I don't know if you were familiar with his work, but he- I'm not, but now I'll, I'll look him up. Thank you. Um, I should New say Yorker too that um, mo usually when you sell a daily cartoon, you can, everybody can submit um, their ideas by nine o'clock in the morning. Hmm. And by 10 o'clock, you find out if you sold. And by noon, you have to have the artwork in. Um, luckily, this was one I had sent uh, with my regular batch. And they, they pulled that out for a daily. So I couldn't have drawn this between 10 and, and hmm. Um, hmm. 12 o'clock anywhere near as, um, as, as well as it, I could draw it with uh, having some advance. So there's that too. So you okay. would have submitted the sketch early on, Teresa. The sketch was yeah. The sketch the sent. sketch went in as a um like a weekly batch, mm -hmm. and they didn't buy it for the magazine, but I, they bought it for use in the future as a daily. So I had time to to draw all that mess. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is another family related one. Um, it's a forlorn student in his desk that looked like my desk that I had in Sacred Heart School. And uh, the teacher is saying, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I didn't know your mom and dad were doing a project together. Is it the kitchen? Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> so, you know, home reno can, you know, it's not fun. Um, let's see. Here we have some campers. And the woman is saying, so is this the fun part or will there be even bigger bugs sticking to my face soon? <laughs> I think it says soon. I can't see the end of the sentence. It, it, does. Um, it does. Okay, that's my feelings about camping. That struck a chord with me too. <laughs> um, here's some cows just talking about their kind of loser guys that they've been with. Um, <laughs> And one is saying, yeah, I broke up with Kevin. One day he let these two flies crawl over his eye for like an hour and he didn't even shake his head. And I had a lot more copy after that. I was like, or blink or, um, so they, they um, edited that down. So it's a little shorter, but I was really happy. That I, I, if I could draw animals speaking to each other, like all the time, that that would make me happy. Cow, cow, uh, Teresa, cows don't seem to inspire you as much as horses. I have to say that. 
Yeah, I know. I didn't grow up. I didn't sit and draw no, cows in my notebook cow, all the time. Right. This is <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. In Vermont, Thank it you. isn't either. But it's... <laughs> Teresa, those were wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing them. Thank you so much for, for letting me. And last but certainly not least, we have the wonderful oh. Michael Shaw. Good. So I'd like to thank Mr. Rockwell for inviting me. Yes. <laughs> uh, the last time I was in a museum, it was at the Thurber House in Columbus, Ohio. I actually got to sleep in the um, in the attic, the uh, mythical ad attic that uh, James's father climbed into. Wow. And yes, I was bitten on the butt by the ghost of Mutt the dog. So I have trauma. <laughs> and speaking of trauma, here's one of my this is a cartoon that ended up on 60 Minutes with uh, Bob Mankoff's profile. Oh. Gays and lesbians getting married. Haven't they suffered enough? <laughs> so it's gonna go downhill from there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> I have a credo, by the way, and that's um, tragedy plus time equals comedy, but who has time anymore? So I can go <laughs> right to the funny. Someone else is gonna have to stop me. So this is uh, probably one of my more popular ones. It's, please enjoy this culturally, ethically, religiously, and politically correct cartoon responsibly. Thank you. It's blank. So what was interesting is this went viral after the Charlie Hebdo shootings uh, as the New Yorker's response to that shooting. But it had been drawn a little earlier than that in response to another shooting. So. Uh, my work has always been comfortable with chaos, conflict, you know, that sort of thing. So this is kind of in my wheelhouse right now. Ah, this is a historical cartoon. Uh, not yet bought by anyone, but you can see why. The colors were <laughs> Hamilton's idea. This is Bob's favorite cartoon and that's why I included it. So uh, it's a great cartoon. It's fun. Bob, what, what was it that attracted you to this cartoon? Uh, the mantle. You know, I'm a big fan mantle. of mantles. <laughs> I've been talking about working mantles into your cartoons. I told you yes. that's what you needed. Uh, when I first started, they said, Michael, could you draw better? And I said, no. <laughs> said, your, your furniture looks like it's made out of cheese. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm in Wisconsin. What do you expect? Anyway, this is the rock. See, you can still see there's a little pencil drawn. Michael, I love the way you draw. It's like the Clash. The songs still have spit in them. Your cartoons have spit in them. It feels personal. I feel connected. And I'm serious. I really like the way you draw. And I do like this cartoon. It, I think it hits on a couple of levels. Well, I'm going to give it to you, Bob. You can have it. I, I, I love it. I don't know if you have to give it to me. I don't, <laughs> let's don't get carried away. <laughs> Michael, I have to ask you a question, though. Sure. Uh, right. You obviously are having been with Thurber and been around Thurber. Are you aware yeah, of this? Yes, we're good friends. <laughs> there was a wonderful um, in incident recounted by E.B. White back in the 20s when Thurber and he were beginning at the New Yorker. And Thurber, he, White came, White and he collaborated a lot on cartoon ideas. Um, but Thurber was not a cartoonist uh, yeah. initially. And uh, he thought he he needed to improve his drawing, so he was at one point in his office cross workings uh, to improve what he felt were inadequate drawings, and he was working at cross hatching, trying to learn it. And White came into the office and saw him uh, at this, and he said, "What are you doing?" And he said, "Well, I'm trying to get better." And he said, "Stop! If you got any better, you'd be mediocre." Exactly. So, <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> anecdote. Well, I you no, no, I, I, I'm a very, I'm a, a, quite a fan of Thurber and kind of a student of his. And his, uh, uh, I, I guess uh, what I like about his drawing is like uh, it's sublime indifference, uh, and it's all carried by the caption. Which this one is from the Rejection Collection, uh, a series of books, and that's. It's pretty self-evident why it was rejected. Stop and I'll shoot. And, you know, unfortunately, it's become timeless. So, hmm. uh, 
know. I've, <laughs> this one always troubled me and for obvious reasons. Well, I, I guess that means we're working in verities that, that are that <clears throat> large ideas that are in our culture. And the, so that il illustrates just that. Yeah, I, t I tend to take a, a really big idea and then boil it down to maybe its most absurd moment. So I'm not taking a, well, there's an obvious point of view you would take here, but most of them I try to leave a little ambiguity. I'm not, I don't consider myself an editorial cartoonist, but I do consider myself sort of a commentator, so. Yeah, I think, I think this is what we all are, are trying to do in our ways. And in terms of, I, I just wondered, in terms of the way that you're all writing captions, uh, like for example, in this case, uh, stop and I'll shoot is obviously based on something that is heard, but in a different way, uh, stop or I'll shoot. And right. so does, is that something that is important in car cartooning to kind of- oh, Yeah, I, I, I do ideas first and usually the caption will come first and I'll say, oh, I'm gonna draw that. Like the first cartoon I ever saw, sold at the New Yorker was uh, Chicken Soup for the Criminally Insane. <laughs> you know, I just, in fact, I heard someone say that. They ought to do a chicken soup for the criminal insane. I go, that's a cartoon. And this one too, after dinner, we're going to sit around and watch you play lacrosse. So, you know, before football. I think that's a good topic for further discussion about where, yes. how you, how these things get generated. This one's kind of interesting. So it's Lincoln speaking to Grant saying, should I free the gays too? <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm That one up here to the New Yorker and I'm not sure why, so. <laughs> it, it was of its time, let's put it that way. I've always enjoyed this one. Please stand and join us in half-assing your way through our national anthem. <laughs> and I actually took this when Mankoff used to do a blog, and he called this old unsingable because, you know, uh, everyone gets about halfway through the national anthem and kind of goes to that. And you're like, okay. Anyway, it's a tough song. Definitely a tough song. Ah, uh, here's my go at the pandemic, pandemic. While scientists remain on, divided on the origins of the latest virus, they do agree it's as cute as a button. So. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm always taken by the attractiveness of the viruses, especially the coronavirus. <laughs> How is it red and green? It's like Christmas. Can't we put something, can we put in something about rich white guys don't have to pay taxes? That's, you know, our founding fathers. Thank you. Michael, you mentioned that you got a little bit of pushback on this from your readers. And I'm wondering, um, you know, how important it is or, or how interesting it is for you to have response from your readers. Oh, yes, um, I think if someone's not at least slightly taken aback. I haven't tried hard enough. So <laughs> I need a reaction. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, every, like my blank cartoon, that was kind of interesting because is it black? Is it white? You know, it's nothing, you know. So there's, there's all sorts of reactions. And I try to leave the reaction kind of projective to the person looking at the cartoon. So what they bring to it will usually you know, is part of their reaction. Yeah. Thank you. I'm honored to be standing in front of all of you commemorating the memories and accomplishments of our great class. So this was, you know, during, I, I work at a university and everyone's having a remote uh, uh, graduation. Uh, this one actually never sold because I think I was trying to be, you know, too sincere, so. You know, I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like the drawing. So I'll keep pitching that one, but hopefully it'll, you know, no one will need selfie valedictorians anymore. So. Hopefully not, but it's a wonderful drawing. Thank you. 
And of course, this is the new abnormal, the Macy's Day Parade. <laughs> Chopping that one around. I get, oh, these, I I get these, I, I get these responses. They go like, we like this cartoon, but I, I fear for my karma. <laughs> I said, I, I absolve you of any responsibility of running this cartoon. I think I have one more. No, I have two more. Okay, this is, I've seen you've been visiting Earth again. <laughs> the measles. Remember when the measles were all we had to worry about? Yeah. Those good, good days. old days. The good old days, yes. Yeah. And finally, on a high note, I can't be grim all the time. So. <laughs> Love his outfit. Yeah, yeah. Paisley, Paisley's making a comeback. <laughs> and thank you so much, Michael. They are absolutely oh, wonderful I drawings. I enjoyed that. <clears throat> and with that, I'm actually going to stop sharing the screen, and I will. We'll look forward to questions from the audience. Um, I guess I'm wondering from all of you. I might just start with with one um, question which focuses on our theme, but what do you feel that humor does for us uh, as people, you know, in, in difficult times and just in general? Do you think about that as you draw in terms of what uh, things might mean to your audience and how you might be actually helping them through some of the trials of the current times? I think, I think it, it puts things in perspective. Like if you can't get back to laughing at stuff, you know, we're all only here for a certain amount of time. <laughs> you, it's cliche, but you might as well crack up at what's so tragic. So I think it's about putting things, putting things back in perspective. In my case, I, I simply don't think about this issue. Uh, it's more mm -hmm. from the well of my own discomfort in, in <laughs> the society and living in this life. And um, what springs forth in a way is I trust and hope it will have resonance and ring bells and tap so shoulders of people who, who see it and who and it would, will give them some perspective on what is in fact a very difficult situation uh, all the time. And the pandemic is truly difficult, it's disastrous. But, we, but even before the pandemic, uh, for many people and for most of us, it's, life is, uh, is a very interesting kaleidoscope of difficulty and joy as well. So all of this is mixed up in how I work. And with nary a thought about my audience, uh, hoping and trusting that they will each grab and and extract something of value from the work that I cannot predict at all. Mm -hmm. and so it's 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 a, it's an article of faith that uh, I have something to say. It seems to have had a resonance for a long time, so I might as well just just you know kind of assume that and soldier on. Absolutely. I'd like to add something to that too. Sure. Although, even though Ed said it so well, in my case, it's not thinking of terms of cartoons, but just in general, making people laugh. Sometimes I feel like it's a job or my responsibility to release the tension in a room, whether it's going to see, let's say, the family, and let's say it's a, a crisis or some, it's a bad event. I sometimes think it's my job to diffuse the situation using humor, and that's what my God gift was to do is to in some way bring that to people who are going through a tough time and sometimes that's through a cartoon but a lot of times i feel that responsibility it's truly so meaningful and actually from the comments that we're receiving right now people are saying what a wonderful um you know midweek relief this conversation has been um but we have a, a great question here from our audience and that is um you know, how have you, this is from David Nicholson. How have you handled rejection during your, throughout your career? And is it any easier now than it was in the beginning? Well, as the senior member here, I can say 
absolutely no, it's not easier. And it's always, it's always a true depressive moment when things that I love and think have great buoyancy and meaning just fall into the cracks and nothing, nothing resonates with. I know how I handle it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, tried, I've tried that. It doesn't work. I don't have any of you guys cried? Keep trying. Cry? Not cry, but cries? I would say depress depression is, is, a, is a frequent response. I thrive on rejection. <laughs> <laughs> like a weed. I guess I wonder if you wouldn't mind to explain to our audience who might not understand just in terms of this concept of acceptance or rejection, how your cartoons are submitted, how many you work on, you know, in any given time, and, um, you know, what that process uh, is like, and if you have any sense of what the decision making is uh, at a magazine in terms of the selection process. But what what's your weekly uh, experience like in terms of submitting? Anyone? <laughs> and yeah, Teresa, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I try to come up with 10 cartoons a week. And if you make a sale prior to that, it's like, I, I can, I can pump out 10, you know, but after time lapses and you feel like you've sent in like really good stuff, it gets harder. And I start looking, sometimes I'll look forward to those days that I'm going to like start putting a submission together and go, Oh my God, I got it. And then I say, yeah, you got it really bad. Um, but you, you send in on a usually Tuesday and you find out on a Friday. Um, and at least with, with the New Yorker, it's, it's not a rejection because it, you just didn't get accepted, but I'm sure we've all gotten letters and, um, you know, they're not saying we turn this down for a reason, but, uh, at least so that, that's a, that's a good one at the New Yorker. And there's always like the next week, which is awesome. It's not like you have to wait for a quarter or a month, it's always the next week. So that's that's my experience. Just it relentless. put it out and get back I on the horse. For, sorry, Teresa. I submitted for like two years. I won a contest uh, and got a weekend at the Algonquin, uh, completely paid for, met Bob Mankoff, met Ross Chass. And I go, wow, finally I'm in. And it was another two years that I kept submitting. And then finally I got this big packet I go, wow, it's my, it's my acceptance, uh, my onboarding uh, uh, documentation from the New Yorker. I opened up, it was everything I had sent in before. <gasps> One little note that said, please, uh, please enclose postage if you want these sent back again. <laughs> and that was from Bob. Oh, <laughs> oh and terrible. I go, and I said, wow, he actually looked at them. <coughs> oh. So, you, you measure your career at the New Yorker in terms of years and decades. I mean, you can't, you can't, you really can't live from week to week, so. And let me explain that Bob is Bob Mankoff, who right. used to be the cartoon editor at the magazine. So, you know, and he said, Michael, we really like your work. Don't move to New York. So, you know, I stayed in Wisconsin. And I guess uh, we have a, another question here, which is, um, does the editorial decision-making change depending upon uh, who the cartoon editor may be? Or is there a, uh, you know, a shift in what things look like or maybe what's chosen? Ed's had the most of those, so. Yeah. That's true. Um, yes, there have been a huge change over time, depending on the cartoon editor, the act the editor of the magazine, uh, all are factors and each, uh, the editor of the magazine in, uh, as best I know, has been the, the decider <coughs> of cartoons and the editor, cartoon editor has brought 
uh, has vetted the submissions over the years, um, whittled them down from the thousands they get each week um, to a manageable amount, I guess. I mean, if I'm, I'm not, uh, a caveat here, I'm not privy, I never have been to, to the process. It's always been as an outsider. And, and what I'm saying is kind of gleaned almost intuitively from what I think happened. But I never was able to know how any editor would react to any work I ever submitted. So Sean had his own ideas uh, uh, of what constituted a cartoon. And I think it was based on his predecessor, Harold, and founder of the magazine, Harold Ross, who had a very specific idea of what a cartoon should be and the kind of drawing and the kind of individuality the cartoonists should have. I mean, he, he was very, um, he and Sean both were immensely respectful of individuality in the cartoonists, of individual style, voice, philosophy, and so on. So, uh, so there was a, a wide range of, of drawing and a wide range of thinking from Arno to Price to Charles Adams to all the great early cartoonists, Hokinson, and on and on. They were all nurtured and brought on board and, and kind of given their, their way, their head. They could do what they wanted uh, stylistically. There, were, there was never any direction other than uh, a kind of overriding notion that these should be relevant, these cartoons, to, to American life and society and make light of it in a respectful way, not a cruel way. That was Ross's mandate. Uh, after um, uh, after Ger Jim Garrity, who, I, who took me on under his wing, then came Lee Lorenz, who was a cartoonist uh, and for me, a friend, and he worked with William Sean, and then he worked with the next editor who was, uh, after Sean was summarily relieved by the owner, um, but Robert Gottlieb uh, for a brief moment, and then Tina Brown, and so on. So the, the, <clears throat> And then Bob Makoff was hired under the, in the regime of um, Tina Brown, and each time I never knew what exactly was, uh, only of the Garrity, who was part of a tr long tradition, and Lee who was part of the long tradition of New Yorker relation relationship between art editors and editors who with whom they worked. So it's a long way around of saying, I, I remember, never know. I remember Bob saying he submitted over 900 cartoons before he got his first okay. Mm -hmm. So you know the hell he was going to put everyone else through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think um, based upon what you're talking about, Ed, I think we do all feel as though we have had a chance to get to know you through your work. And that's such a wonderful thing, you know, as you see it over the years and um, really get a sense of what your personal approach and style is. Um, we have a, one interesting specific question from Nicholas um, in terms of the concept of relevance and current events. Have any of you ever actually taken inspiration from the Olympics? We must have a, an athlete in the audience. Oh. Well, I, I just did a, a cartoon, Remote Olympics. We came up with all the events that were going to be taking place remotely, like cross country relationships and, and things like that. One I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Me? Yes. Um, I, 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 this is mad related, but I had an article um, back when I first started and it was the obesity Olympics, like Ameri <laughs> obese America. So that was fun. And it took up three pages because everybody was. <laughs> I did one cartoon of uh, someone carrying the torch and uh, it was during the Russian Olympics and the flame is going straight up about a uh, hundred in the air and the, the only the punchline is vodka <laughs> <laughs> it's still available <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, question for Michael specifically. Yes. Uh, when when did you draw the stop and shoot cartoon? When okay. when was that created? It was probably ugh, ten years ago, and it was for this collection called the Rejection Collection, and it was that was edited by Matt Diffie, who was actually one of the co-winners of the cartoon contest I won at the Algonquin. So he got two cartoonists out of that deal. And the idea was to come up with cartoons you knew would never appear in the New York. <laughs> and being true to the spirit of the enterprise, I actually submitted that. I said, if they take this, I will die. I mean, uh, I, it's the content itself. I still think it's a, it's a strong cartoon. Uh, yeah, very. It, it's actually feels as relevant today as when I drew it back then, but you know, that was the sort of issue has always been an issue. Not like, you know, it's not, this is nothing new, so. You and Ed have like a batting average better than no Nostradamus because there's so many cartoons that are still like almost evergreen. Sort of a reflection that this country doesn't learn too much from its history. Yeah. Or yeah, well, it, you know, it, these issues, have, it's sort of like the pandemic has, supercharged everything in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything's been kind of turbocharged. We need more statues so we can learn. Mm. <laughs> Another question from the audience is, um, who have your greatest inspirations been? Uh, a great question, because I, I have to, um, I have something here that will really be it's a quote from a, to the um, Greek poet George Seferis, and, I, and this, this I take very personally. He said, uh, and this applies to cartoon, any artist really, he said, don't ask me who's influenced me. A lion is made up of the lambs he's digested, and I've been reading all my life. So the, that, and in my case, I've been looking at cartoons and cartoonists and artists of all ages, centuries, uh, and uh, styles and over the year, or, or, over my years. And uh, those are my those are my lambs. I'm, they're all in me somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? Who could follow that? Jeez. Seriously. <laughs> I want lamb now. That sounds good. Well, for I'm, I'm the New Yorker cartoonists of, of the great tradition of New Yorker cartooning have been. Yeah, I actually, mm -hmm. I received a copy of this book called Thurber and Company when I was ten years old, and I'm still not quite sure why I got it for my parents got it for Christmas, and I I would sit there and stare at it, and he he had a series of cartoons like Christmas. More, morning near Sioux Falls, North Dakota, and it was just a straight line. That was it. It was Christmas morning somewhere else, and it was kind of a little curvy line. <laughs> I go, that's cartooning? I can do that. <laughs> so, uh, I've always been a Thurber guy. Mm. Well, actually, Stephanie, I'd like to add that me and Michael both are big <sighs> Bob and Ray fans. I have a lot of old comics that we really admire, and that's an inspiration. Right, so actually uh, comics as opposed to, um, or oh, comedians, sure. do you mean comedians? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's great, yes. Who are, some of your, who are some of your favorites? Well, Bob and Ray would be one, and <clears throat> I have to say the odd couple was an inspiration. Mm -hmm. Everything. I mean, my parents could be an inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> All different things. And, and like Ed put it so well, it's sort of a fabric that you kind of meld together and then you stir it up. You add a little uh, specks of your own voice yeah. and then it comes out something else. But I guess everything can be traced back to something else. I mean, there's no such thing as it not being influenced by something. I, I guess my biggest influence was initially Buster Keaton and all his movies, mm -hmm. the, the general and stuff. I, I was a film mm -hmm. major in art school and in art school, I didn't uh, do any cartooning at all. And uh, I mean, not that art school didn't help me a lot. I, I met my wife there. <laughs> <laughs> not, not initially, I want to add that my wife and I were not 
I did not get along in school. I wouldn't say we were enemies, but we were almost enemies. But we ran into each other again 12 years later at a funeral, which everyone knows the markets. And so art school came back to me and helped me 12 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, any, any, uh, anything you might want to mention? Well, I'm going to, this is, this is non-New Yorker and maybe, um, well, I don't think it's, it's lowbrow, but Gary Larson. I loved Gary Larson's work. And I did not grow up um, looking at, at cartoons. I mean, my father read me the funnies, you know, the comics, but um, I, didn't, I was not educated on who cartoonists were. And the same with Mad Magazine. When I came into Mad Magazine, everybody knew who everybody was. And I didn't. I spent my youth, like I could tell you what was on liner notes of albums, but um, so, I came into it from a different angle. Um, it was kind of like, this is, this is like what I can do and, and practicality. How, how do I do it now? Where do, where do I go? And so that's, uh, and, and now of course I know of so many other wonderful cartoonists that yeah, you, you take it all in. Well, it's funny when the cow, when your cow drawing came up, Somebody wrote in the chat that <laughs> your work reminded them of Gary Larson. Oh, many, so many cow, moons ago. It was, must have been the cows. That's great. Many, many moons, moons ago, ago there was many a... Moons. Many moons. I just said moons. Oh. <laughs> um, many moons ago, there was a local creative arts magazine around here, and they had a, a Gary Larson contest. And um, I actually... I won. I won. <laughs> so, yeah, cool. I guess I like Larson. Did you drop now? Thank you. So here's cool. kind of a fun question. Um, have, have any of you ever laughed out loud at your own cartoon? Yeah. <laughs> is it like a prerequisite for saying this is, this is good or no? They're well, usually the ones that don't sell. Oh. The ones that really crack, I, not they don't crack me up all the time, but I have laughed at some things that I've made up. I've laughed out loud when they're so bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. If my wife says that's not funny, it's got half a chance. <laughs> that's just wrong. I go, yes, yes. I'm Sometimes I'll break into a, a half smile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every now and then a chuckle. But, you know, I said, it's just sort of like an, an aha moment. But basically, I just know that they're funny somehow, or they are funny to me. Yes. That you they might. Yeah, you ruminate on them for so long that, you know. Yeah, yeah. The initial idea you're amused by, and then, like, here comes the torture of creating it. So. Well, it's a great craft, because, and when you think about crafts people, uh, you know, whether they're admiring and, and kind of enjoying each and every moment of their work, turning a piece of wood or doing mm -hmm. cabinet, this and that. You know, it's, it's just a daily, a part of your life, your daily work life. It's a, it's a form of, of, well, craftsmanship, really. And it's funny, when I'm drawing, it's, it's like when you're boiling pasta and you throw a piece against the, the wall and see if it sticks. And it sticks, you're like, okay, that's pretty good. And, you know, mm -hmm. that quick. So, but sometimes you do feel like you know that it's working. You do know that the cartoon is good. And um, other times when you don't have that feeling, you just know that the answer is somewhere down the road. Yeah. But you have to keep going back. I've learned this from stand-ups who I happen to have met about how to just be diligent and just keep on trying and not settle for the first comfortable answer, but to keep pushing it back and back. And it's often like, I, I used the metaphor of the African queen. If you remember when the ship is in the, in the reeds and they're looking for the open water, that they don't know how close they are to the ocean. Sometimes you don't know how close you are to the ocean, but when you do reach the ocean, you know it. Yeah, and that's that's so, great. That's how I feel about creating. Bob, you, you bring up an interesting contrast between stand-up comedians and, and what we do. 
and the solitude in which we worked and the public arena that they th are brave enough to enter and the question of laughter and response is so different that mm -hmm. you know, it's basically you who have to respond to your very own work. And, uh, and, and the other aspect of this is that when it appears in the magazine, it appears to deafening silence. I mean, there's <laughs> a way of knowing. Especially uh, in my home. How, <laughs> but there's no, I rarely get a response other than, oh, that was a nice drawing the other day. Yes. Good, no, nice work. Okay. Well, Eddie, I'm going to tell you right now, in my home, I'm laughing hysterical at your cartoon. I'll make a tape and send it because you have made my house laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear that. I think that's the power of the work that, you know, they, they, it reaches so many people and it impacts them and yet you don't get to hear about that and that, that's probably very hard. Well, one of the great pleasures of giving a PowerPoint or a slideshow or talking publicly with you, with one's work in, you know, on, in your pocket is that you actually get to hear the laughter. Finally, after yeah. decades yeah. and years, you know, oh, really? So that's, that's what happens. It's kind of great. Yeah. And believe me, it is happening all over the place. And maybe we will um, actually give you one more here uh, from Patricia. So her question is, what are the biggest cliches or things that are not funny that cartoonists should try to avoid? Mm -hmm. Are there things that are really cliches that come up over and over again? Or can a cliche be really helpful when drawing a cartoon? Well, I've, I can leap in and just say the cliches that have developed over the New Yorker's lifespan, the, that is the psychiatrist's couch, yeah. the desert island. Um, I can't think, of, there, there are others. I can't, the Grim uh, Reaper. The Grim Reaper. Ah. Uh, on. Sorry, Mike. And the Sabret hot dog card. That's another one that I see quite a bit. Uh, so yeah, all of, all of that is uh, kind of off limits for me. But that said, there's always some innovation, some originality that can be brought to it in the sense that there is no poor subject ever. So, uh, yeah, I agree. I tried. You. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to say there's no rules. If it works and it makes people laugh, then it works. So mm -hmm. you can break the rules and you could go back to the well, the things that you thought everything was said about it over and over. If you could have a fresh voice to it, then, and then it's demonstrated in the slideshow of the other three artists that I saw, how they've taken something and turned it on its head and gave it a fresh mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true because the cliches are an easy vi visual reach, so they're read very quickly. And then when you can turn them around a little bit, yeah, it's sort of a kind of a reward. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoy good cliche. <laughs> I, um, I tried it. Nobody bought it, but I have a um, the the island with the shipwreck guy, and I have the Grim Reaper on the island saying, "Shipwreck guy, my man, we're probably we're finally in the same cartoon together because he's you know <laughs> I'm gonna get the shipwreck guy." But well, that's a Joe Duffy cartoon. That's why it maybe didn't sell. Oh, Joe it is. Duffy, Joe Duffy has done that. It's a it's a great cartoon. He ripped it was, me off. And, and the banner says, "Good news, bad news." <laughs> Ah, there's a great one. one. There's it's a great one. Then. Yes, there's a great one. I don't even know who drew it, but it's somebody on a uh, two people on a desert island, and there's there's a bunch of people in the boat, and they say, "Oh, they're cartoonists. They're not going to rescue us." <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> Michael, what about Warren Miller's cartoon, where the Grim Reaper comes on the desert island and chops down the palm tree? <laughs> I don't remember that one. It's on the back cover of Mort Gerber's book. Oh, that's a look at that. I did a Grim Reaper meeting this woman, and the woman says, <laughs> simply must meet my husband. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. I yeah. saw that one. I just drew one the other day where the guy in the desert island gets killed by a coconut falling from the tree. <laughs> just knocked out. <laughs> well, 
You can't end on that sad note, sorry. <laughs> um, so we have maybe this one last one could be an interesting uh, end note to this wonderful evening. But the question is, um, is creating cartoons therapeutic for mm -hmm. you? Or in my mind, is it, is it a great challenge and a cause of some frustration? So is there some therapy to it? Or uh, I don't know. It's, I always think it's really miraculous that you have been able to work and live as artists. And um, I think that concept of whether it's therapeutic is very interesting. Well, I guess it's a question of what therapy, what this, the questioner means by therapy, because um, <clears throat> it means that there's some, some uh, ailment, some hurt that has to be dealt with through one's work. And that's never, never a reliable way to approach what one does as a professional artist and cartoonist. It's far more um, a sense of one's calling and what you want to do rather than make yourself feel better through your own work. Needless to say, one, we all probably feel great if it really works well. Uh, and, but we apply, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a form of, of, of mental health. Uh, although when one works wonderfully, you feel really terrific about yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I, and and not, but it, it's, it's certainly not a therapeutic. Art is not therapy. Ed, they always unless, say unless it's it out to be. They say that laughter is the best medicine, Ed. But I always say uh, medicine is the best medicine first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take medicine. Take medicine. Or, or uh, if it's therapy, I'm not getting any better. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's um, I, convenience. I can't say it's therapy for me. It, it is my, my job. Mm. My, my great joy. Um, so I think what Ed said is pretty um, on point and, and perfectly said. Per it was a perfect sentence. Teresa, what about what I said? Well, <laughs> but I know what you mean. I, I know what you mean. It's loaded for us because for us, it's also a paycheck. And if we fail in our job, it's money that we're not putting on our table. So for us, there is some pressure built in. It comes, our craft comes with some baggage. Yeah, if you don't sell, then you need therapy. Exactly, it's a cycle. Or well, it therapy or not, the work that you are doing is just extraordinary and so important to so many people. And it really keeps us going, um, not just through difficult times, but, but always. And thank you so much for your exceptional work and for being part of this program this evening. It's really been so enlightening to hear your thoughts and to see your work. And we'd like to thank everybody out there for joining us. It was great to have you with us. Just want to let you know that next Tuesday at 530, we will be with Liza Donnelly and her husband, Michael Maslin, and they're going to be talking about their cartoon marriage. So that'll be a lot of fun. But thank you so much, Michael, thank you. Ed, and Bob. We're so happy to be with you. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and thank, thank you, you Rockwell Museum, and every all and your yes. Thank you, Norman, and everybody stay well. Thank you. You yeah. too. Thanks. Great Thanks honor so to be with you. Have a great evening, everybody. Yeah. You too. Thanks again. See bye you bye. At some point in the blue ribbon or the lobster. Bye. Absolutely. Look forward <laughs> to that.